Alrighty, so I'm back with the Beginner 2 Advanced Guide for Tropico 6. This is a direct continuation of Part 1, so let's get into it. Now before I give some examples of industrializing an island, I want to cover trade deals so you can see how everything works together. Trade routes go hand in hand with production and industry, and if you enjoy stacking modifiers, then this is definitely the topic for you. So let's check out some trade deals by clicking on the trade menu down here at the bottom of the screen. The first time you open this screen, it'll always be sorted by name, and I recommend sorting by import-export. Trade deals with a red arrow pointing away from the island are export deals, and if they have a green arrow pointing onto the island, then they're import deals. Trade offers from superpowers are mostly exports, but you will have some import deals. These percentages over here are the price deviations, and you can sort by deviation to see what your current most lucrative deals are. You're looking for deals with the largest green percentages. Import deals are capped at negative 100%, as this means that you're importing goods for no money, just getting free stuff delivered to your dock. As you can see here, most of the export trade deals are directed towards superpowers. In the first era, the only superpower you can trade with is the crown. In the World Wars era and the Cold War era, you can export to two superpowers, and in the Modern Times era, you can export to five different superpowers. At the beginning of every year, the trade offers will all refresh, so you want to pick up good deals before the end of the year, and you want to check this list often to make sure you don't miss out on any good deals. If you're looking to stack a bunch of price modifiers, be sure to get everything done before January 1st. So if we're wondering how we can change these deviations, luckily there's a lot of ways. The most straightforward of which is to simply increase or decrease your standing with a superpower. The change in prices for this method won't be apparent for the current year, so if you decide to max out the standing with a superpower, you'll have to wait until the next year to get the good offers. The most important building to construct if you want better deals is the customs office. It's a good idea to research it as well and to change the work modes around, as the changes in prices from switching the work modes are instant. To get the most out of this building, make sure you max out the budget and have the building be fully staffed before any deals. Both upgrades are good, and if you plan on doing a lot of trade deals, I definitely recommend getting the tax evasion upgrade early on. The main use of this building is to switch between reduce import taxes and stimulate exports while searching for good deals. Once you set up a ministry, you can choose an industrialist candidate for the foreign affairs option, and this will increase the exported value of all processed goods. The very last topic in the constitution is the global market economy, which will also alter prices. If you don't plan on setting up trade deals, then I definitely choose the protectionism option as this will disable trade offers while giving a flat 5% bonus to all exports. Just to clarify, this doesn't mean you won't be exporting goods at all, it just means that you won't have to worry about these two screens and all the goods that you sell normally will be worth 5% more. By contrast, the international trade partners option will make all goods traded normally worth 5% less, but will make export trade offers worth 10% more. There's also some edicts that can alter import and export prices. Starting in the Cold War era, you have access to the Happy Meat Edict, which will give a bonus to meat exports, and the Made in Tropico Edict, which works well alongside protectionism. Finally, in the modern era, you have access to the best edict in the whole game, the Caribbean Trade Pact Association. The only downside to this edict is it costs $15,000 every time you activate it, and it'll increase Caribbean happiness by a lot, so don't activate it right before an election. So what it actually does is it creates three random import trades with countries from the Caribbean. But instead of the common super red trade offers, these are some of the best import deals in the game. So let's check our current offers and sort by deviation to see what's best. Right now we have five trade deals that are 50% or higher in the green. So now let's activate the edict. We can see that our support will shoot down, but it will eventually come back up. But now let's check the trade offers to see what's changed. And now we can see we have a total of eight that are 50% or higher now. And as a matter of fact, we can get cocoa for 100% off, which is pretty cool. If you plan on getting the tax evasion upgrade for the customs office, make sure to get it before you activate this edict, but you can still change the deviation by changing the work mode of the customs office. In the modern times area, you can use the cyber operations center to get decent deals, but I always found these deals to never be truly that good. You can get way better deviations through conventional methods. So let's take two examples. For the first one, let's say we had no interest in setting up trade routes. I'd recommend getting the Happy Meats and Made in Tropico edicts as soon as you make it to the Cold Wars era. Once you make it to the Modern Times era, research the global markets economy and set it to the protectionism option. Set the foreign affairs candidate to the industrialist. You wouldn't need to worry about building a customs office, and once your edicts are fully leveled up, you'll be left with a flat 15% bonus to all exports and a 22% bonus to all processed goods, and a plus 35% bonus to all meat, and you wouldn't need to worry about anything else.
For our second example, let's say we wanted to focus our entire island on one industry, and we wanted to use a lot of trade routes to generate a lot of money. I would change the global market economy in the constitution to international trade partnership, max out the relationship with at least one superpower. You'll have a better chance at getting good deals the more superpowers you make happy. This is also a good reason to have multiple embassies and to be friends with all the superpowers. Next, I would buy the upgrade tax evasion in the customs office. Finally, you'd want to change the work mode depending on if the trade deal you want is import or export. The stimulate exports work mode and signing an export route with a superpower that has a high standing can lead to some very lucrative trade deals. Like here, we're exporting furniture for almost the price of cars. Change the customs office to reduce import taxes and activate the Caribbean Trade Pact Association edict to get raw resources for dirt cheap. I've gone over everything that there is to know about production, factories, and trade deals, and it's finally time to show a really good example of using them all in tandem to make an efficient system that makes us lots of money. For this example, we'll use a multi-tiered industry and trade routes. Let's say that we want to produce a lot of electronics and decided that four electronic factories would be enough. This industry building is multi-tiered because it needs another whole factory to supply it with resources to process instead of more simple factories that only need production buildings to function. Now you might think that just overproducing raw resources to keep your factories running is a good idea, and with plantation and ranches you'd be right. But if you're working with limited resources like minerals and oil, you'll want to conserve as much as possible. Start by only producing what you need. So an electronics factory has an input storage for plastic of 8,320. And as we can see, a plastic plant has an output of the exact same amount. This tells us that four electronics factories would require four plastic plants. And if you use the same method, we can also see that the four plastic plants would require either four oil wells or two oil rigs. We can also see that four electronic factories would require a total of eight gold mines. These oil and mineral deposits are eventually going to run out, but to keep them going for as long as possible, you want to set up warehouses to store raw resources and set them to allow storage, as the other two options will let resources get brought directly to the dock. So now we have a setup like this where we produce around the same amount of resources as we're processing, and we have room for surplus resources. This would be the time to find some cheap import deals to fill up our warehouses and to find a deal for our electronics to push our profits to the moon. If this island was to get really good trade deals exporting electronics and importing oil, gold, and plastics, it would be printing millions of dollars every decade and we'd still have plenty of open trade slots for more deals. So on to the next topic. Before I get into talking about tourism, I'll quickly talk about some major tips to know about entertainment and luxury entertainment buildings. First off, there are a total of eight entertainment buildings that are affected by the nearby beauty, the tavern, the funfair pier, the botanical garden, the golf course, the hang gliding building, the cocktail bar, the beach resort, and the snorkel bay. I stacked every single modifier I could think of for the tavern, and I got the service quality all the way up to 69, which is pretty good for the cheapest entertainment building in the game. I'm sure if you tried to do a couple more things, you could get it even higher. The botanical garden might just be the worst entertainment building in the game. I wouldn't recommend ever building it unless you're doing it for the aesthetic. The rest of these buildings can easily hit 100 service quality and the golf course can get up to 84 while serving tropicans of all classes, even broke tropicans. The entertainment building that gives the absolute highest fee income is the yacht club. If you put the building in the mucho importante work mode and make the building only for tourists, then you can get the fee all the way up to $2400 per visitor. This is quite a task though as you'll need a lot of filthy rich tourists on the island. The movie theater can be used as a propaganda building if you research it, acting as another media building to influence your population. The gourmet restaurant can be used to increase the standing with superpowers that you invite to embassies with the dignitaries only work mode. I like to get around 3 to get the largest bonus possible. This is pretty expensive though so I only recommend doing it if you're making a lot of money. The hang gliding and cocktail bars can be used to increase the effectiveness of your spy academy. The theater can be put in the improv theater work mode, which will have a chance to increase the standing with the intellectual faction each time a member of that faction visits the building. If your city has a lot of intellectuals, then I definitely recommend building some of these around the island. Having a lot of intellectuals visit these buildings is an easy way to get a standing of 100 with their faction. If you put a casino on the double or nothing work mode, it's pretty much like having two of them, and each visitor is pretty much two visitors. The only risk is that it'll cost twice as much money if no one's visiting the building. And the last tip I have on the entertainment buildings is every tourist and every tropican will always go to the entertainment building that provides the highest service quality that they can afford. 
That's everything I have on entertainment buildings, on to the easiest way to generate a lot of money very quickly, tourism. When you construct entertainment and luxury entertainment buildings, you shouldn't expect these buildings to automatically start printing money. Usually they'll probably lose you a little money over time, but this is fine because your first priority is to use these buildings to increase your population's entertainment happiness. To use these buildings to create a tourist industry, you simply click on this little checkbox titled Tourist Only. Besides not allowing your traffickants to visit, this is going to drastically increase the fee income as we can see with this restaurant. Usually the fee will be around 6 times as expensive. You can increase the fee further by increasing the budget and from work modes and upgrades. Fee increases work a lot better on buildings set to tourist only. This restaurant on the medium budget and set to the cloth napkins work mode gives a fee income of only $14. And if we increase the budget and switch it to the kids menu work mode, we can see that the fee went up to $22. But if we do this exact same thing, but this time have tourist only checked, we can see the fee income went from $84 to $31, almost a fee increase of $50. Before you start switching all of your buildings to tourist only, you need to get tourists onto the island. This is as simple as constructing buildings they can stay at and constructing buildings they can use to get to the island. The tourist port can bring well off and rich tourists and the airport can bring rich and filthy rich tourists. Once you get some tourists on the island and set some of the buildings up that they can spend their money at, you'll quickly reach a point where you'll be making more money than you'll be losing every month. I've never ran into problems with the tourist rating. I've always made a peaceful island when I set up tourism because any military conflicts on the island will cause all of the tourists to flee and I don't think they'll leave a good review. As long as you max out the budgets on all of the tourist buildings, you'll be making a lot of money and your hotels will never be empty. There isn't much else to it, it's pretty hard to screw up, just make sure to keep constructing buildings for tourists and make sure that your tourists don't have to spend their entire vacation walking around the island. All tourists have access to cars, so a good method of getting them around the island is to construct multiple parking decks near locations you want them to visit. Or even better, just have metro stations set up around the island. On to the next topic, public service buildings. I'll cover the faith buildings first. The chapel is a low tier clerical building, but something interesting about it is that anyone can visit it. And if you set it to the help first preach later work mode, you can give some healthcare happiness to anyone who visits. And this is the only way to provide healthcare to people in the broke class without paid healthcare. The church is a mid-tier clerical building, provides max service quality of 75, and I never recommend going with the shared seats work mode. The pompous bells upgrade is good to pick up, but this building will eventually get outclassed by the cathedral. The cathedral is the late game clerical building, and it gives a max service quality of 100. I recommend leaving it on the rock solid faith work mode and getting the Dunning confessionals upgrade. Next I'll go over the healthcare buildings, first up is the clinic. This is the first healthcare building you can pick up, and getting both upgrades as soon as possible is a must. I never recommend switching it to the quack salver work mode as losing so much service quality isn't worth the decrease in wage. This building can serve anyone in the poor class and up, and the maximum service quality can get over 100 with all of the upgrades and with paid healthcare in the constitution. The late game healthcare building is a hospital. It can get well over 100 service quality pretty easily and serves patients in the well off class and up. Getting the upgrade hospitalization wing is a no brainer and I wouldn't switch the work mode to ambulant treatment without paid healthcare and never switch it to treatment studies unless for some reason you wanna generate research points with it. Next is the grocery and the shopping mall. If you don't have either of these buildings on the island, then make sure to leave the checkbox allow local consumption checked on some of your production buildings. Once you build a grocery, you want to get the service quality as high as you can. You want to start by collecting as many of the different food types in the game. There are 11 in total, and this includes fish and shellfish, and the three foods produced in industry buildings, which are canned goods, juice, and cheese. The closer you get to having all the different food types, the higher the service quality will be. Consumer goods can also be stocked into the building, and this will only increase the fee for each different type. This is also how the shopping mall works, but there are some small differences. First off, only well-off tropicans can shop in the shopping mall. The shopping mall isn't affected by the supply local market work mode of the canneries, and you can get the upgrade luxury outlets to stock the building with luxury goods and increase the fee income and service quality even further. The fire station is the next public service building, and there isn't too much to it. I always opt for the building inspections work mode, and it will decrease the upkeep cost of all nearby buildings. The cat in the tree work mode is a solid choice if you want to increase the housing quality of nearby residential buildings. The high pressure nozzle upgrade will probably save you money over the course of time, and the helicopter upgrade is really good if you have the funds to purchase them. Having a small fleet of helicopters can quickly deal with a large amount of fires all over the island. 
The asylum is used to deal with political dissidents on the island. If you check out the factions in the politics tab of the almanac, you can see how your population believes. If they are diehard members of any factions, they won't ever change this political belief. If you want to force them to believe in what you believe, you can detain them in an asylum, and once they recover, they'll lose their political beliefs based on the efficiency of the building. The work modes are both good, and if you go with the way of the blue pilled work mode, you can force people to emigrate without having to have them publicly assassinated. Next up is waste management. Pollution will build up from a number of different buildings, especially from industry. Your tropicans will actually have a lower lifespan if they spend too much time in these polluted areas. So it's a good practice to build some sort of waste management. If not for your industrial buildings, then at least near people's homes and the main part of your town. The cheaper building is the garbage dump. This building has a very large area of effect and will slowly fill up over time. Once it's full, you'll need to spend $10,000 to keep the building running. You can choose whether to focus only on industry or only on residential buildings, and I would only do this if you're absolutely sure that that's how you want it to be. The all trash is equal work mode will do fine most of the time. The more expensive building is the waste management building. This building has a much smaller area of effect, but it's also a lot more effective. It'll never fill up and you can actually have the building generate a small amount of electricity with the refuse incineration work mode. The scrap head scrounging upgrade is pretty meh, but worth picking up if you have a lot of money to throw around. That's everything for the public service buildings. Now over to military buildings. I went over how to set up your island for defense and the quick tips at the beginning of the video. Now I wanna talk about each of the buildings individually. The fort is an early game military building that you build alongside the guard towers to defend your island. The fort can be used for all sorts of things throughout the eras, but the most practical is to build one near your late game military base to provide the arsenal upgrade bonus to all of your military buildings. All of the tower buildings, the fort, the commando garrison, security checkpoints, and the defense HQ buildings all have a liberty penalty, so be careful when building these buildings near your population. Tower buildings are tempting to put near your population to discover hidden roles, but having an overwatch tower right next to a bus stop is sure to cause some rebellion. Building barracks is a good idea if you don't plan on building a peaceful island. Picking up the upgrades is a good idea anytime you can afford it. The army bases are really neat as they can provide two tanks to roll around your island. The wages are much higher than the barracks, but the tanks are much stronger than infantry squads. If you can make it to the point where you can afford to make this building, then you can probably afford the upgrade which makes the tanks even stronger. The only military building that can generate income is the security checkpoint with its road tolls work mode. This building will generally lose you money every month unless you can find a particularly busy road. I don't think this building is ever worth keeping around unless you're willing to lower the liberty nearby. And if you do end up doing this, pick up the rubber gloves upgrade to be able to discover crime lords and rebel leaders. The raid buildings are the Pirate Cove, the Commando Garrison, the Spy Academy, and the Cyber Operations Center. If raid buildings are sitting idle, they'll generate raid points based on efficiency, and they all have access to the Treasure Hunt raid, which can get you $10,000 for free sometimes. Pirate Coves can also steal a bunch of various raw resources, and can bring a bunch of immigrants to the island very quickly if you want to grow your population. The Commando Garrison is a much more militant raid building. Intimidate neighbors can give you a small boost in support if you need it. Guerrilla patrol will wipe out some of the rebels on your island. Sabotaging a superpower will stop them from invading for a short while. If you're going to keep this building around, it can actually provide military support to your military buildings with a provide tactical insight work mode. This won't show on the affected buildings, but it gives your squads extra hit points in battle, which can really make the difference in a fight. The spy academy can be used to spy on your population. Observation will reveal hidden roles like criminals, rebels, and even rebel leaders and foreign spies. Provoke Rebellion is kind of self-explanatory. It'll make rebels on your island take up arms. Espionage raids can be really useful with a chance to steal blueprints or research topics that are really expensive. The Cyber Operations Center can create random trade routes with decent deviations. I wouldn't recommend taking these deals though, and it can also generate good tourist ratings, but this is never really a concern. And finally, the final few buildings that can generate good money, the government and finance buildings. Dungeons, prisons, and police stations can all work together to create a system where you get paid to incarcerate your own tropicans. You can get a courthouse to generate even more money. Now I've never set up an industry centered around crime, but I figured it would make for an interesting island where your tropicans can climb the social ladder by becoming criminals, and we'd make money if they were arrested. An immigration office can alter immigration by increasing it, lowering it, or getting more educated people to immigrate. The customs office can help you get a lot more money from trade deals, but it can also bring in some money based on how many tourists are arriving on your island. 
The Ministry is one of the most unique buildings to construct. I'll quickly list off some of the candidates for each position and what they do. For the Department of Education, you have the Religious and Militarist candidate, both of which will influence your tropicans once they graduate from high school. The Communist candidate will increase the amount of students in education buildings. The Intellectual candidate will generate extra knowledge based on the number of education buildings you have. And the Capitalist candidate is the most extreme, which will only allow well-off and rich tropicans to have their kids educated in the school system. For the Department of Defense, we have the Militarist candidate. They'll make your police stations provide militia squads during military conflicts. The Capitalist candidate will make your military buildings all 10% cheaper to upkeep. The Conservative candidate will cause your military squads to deal more damage to rebels. And the Industrialist candidate will make military buildings cost less money to construct. For the Department of Economy, you can have a Communist candidate that will make your construction costs for residential buildings 7% cheaper. A Capitalist candidate that will make all your buildings on the maximum budget 7% more efficient. This is definitely the best upgrade you can give your island if you're always playing on the maximum budget. The Industrialist candidate will make all mines and oil producing buildings 5% more efficient, and the Environmentalist candidate will decrease the pollution of all industrial buildings. For the Department of Foreign Affairs, we got the Militarist candidate that will make all of the raid buildings 5% more efficient. The Intellectual candidate can generate a lot of knowledge if you have a superpowers relation really high. The Industrialist candidate will increase the base cost of all exported processed goods. This is a really good choice if you're focused on industry and trade deals. And lastly, we have the Environmentalist candidate that will increase increase the tourism rating of your island. And finally, we have the Department of Interior. The religious candidate will cause all faith buildings to have a chance to make criminals and rebels lose their roles. The communist candidate will increase the job quality of the entire island by two. The intellectual candidate will increase the area of effect of all media buildings by 10%. The conservative candidate will increase the effectiveness of all buildings that decrease crime. And finally, the environmentalist candidate will lower the pollution of all residential buildings by 20%. Now on to embassies. These are the best get out of jail free cards as long as you can maintain a high standing with superpowers. If you have 5 embassies in the modern times era and are friends with every superpower, you can ask them for a total of $100,000. Lastly, you want to set them up in nice areas to get a boost to the relation of the invited superpowers. Banks are pretty unique as they generate money based on their efficiency and on how much money you have on your treasury. I'm not sure what the cap is, but I tend to try and stay above 100,000 after building a bank. You can set your banks to the slush funds work mode to embezzle money into your Swiss bank account, or you can put them on the private banking work mode to generate money based on how many rich and filthy rich tropicans you have on the island. Usually you can only be around $10,000 in debt before you can spend no more money, but banks can extend this limit by $5,000 with the state loans upgrade. So if you buy this upgrade on three separate banks, you can keep spending money until you make it to $25,000 in the negative. The office can become a whole industry on its own once you start generating a lot of college educated tropicans. Both the bank and the office will make less money the more you have on the same work mode, but offices have a lot more unique work modes. Corporate business will generate money based on how many employed tropicans you have on the island. Consumer business will generate money based on the total number of families living in residential buildings. Official business will generate money based on how many tropicans you have working in the government and finance buildings. Solid and progressive business or work modes you unlock by researching the office. And the They'll generate money based on how many tropicans are members of the intellectual and conservative factions respectively. If you set up some very effective high schools and a good college, you can quickly get to the point where you're constructing offices as fast as you can and generating more money than you know what to do with. The offshore office can be used to sacrifice standing with a superpower to generate money. It also gives a small bonus to the export prices of two goods depending on which country you invite. Here's a list of all the bonuses. Your courthouse can also be switched to the business law work mode to generate money based on how many offices and offshore offices you have. So we talked about all the ways to generate money and you might be wondering how all this money trickles down to your population. What makes a tropican poor or well off or rich? It's pretty simple so I'll briefly explain it all. As an example, let's take a tropican that's single and has no children. If they're unemployed, they'll be in the broke class. If they make a wage less than $10 a month, they'll be in the poor class. If they make a wage of at least $10 a month and less than $20 a month, then they'll be in the well-off class. If they make a wage of at least $20 a month and less than $50 a month, they'll be in the rich class. And of course, if they make a wage over $50 a month, they'll be in the filthy rich class.
If two tropicans get married, it'll average out their wages. So if one of them makes $11 a month putting them in the well-off class, but their spouse makes like $4 a month, then they'll both be in the poor class. If they have children, this will be a drain on their incomes. I haven't figured out the exact numbers for this, but if two tropicans make a wage of $10 a month and are barely scraping into the well-off class, but then they have a child together, they'll all be dragged down into the poor class. You can get around this by researching and enacting the child allowances edict. Once it's fully leveled up, it'll go down to only $1 per month per child, so it's best to get this early on. This information may not be vital to most islands you'll build, but it can be very useful if you want to make an island with mostly rich and well-off tropicans, or if you want to make an island with only poor tropicans. Trying to make an island where you only use the lowest budgets on all the buildings to have an entire population be poor can be a very fun challenge. Here's a list of all the buildings that can't provide a wage of less than $10 a month. These buildings specifically have a minimum wage of exactly $10 a month, so you could get away with building some of them and still have a population of mostly poor tropicans. But let's say that you wanted a population of no poor people, then I definitely recommend picking up the Child Allowances Edict and not building any of these buildings on this list, as the maximum wage they can offer is less than $10 a month, and they will very often produce at least some poor tropicans. Annoyingly, both the grocery and the shopping mall are both on this list, so if you want to get a food happiness above 57, then you need to build at least one of these buildings. Also, both the bus station and the parking deck are on this list, so your best course of action to avoid building these buildings while still providing public transportation would be to build metro stations, as they can give a max wage of $10 a month. And that's everything there is to know about wages. So we talked about all the ways that you can make money and what this means for your tropicans. Now I want to quickly cover infrastructure and overall city design. The overall design of your island doesn't matter too much, but structuring your island is going to be much more efficient and aesthetically pleasing. My first tip is to build your city with straight roads. You can make city blocks like I do in this build. My plan was to do a 5x7 city block to leave a 4x6 square that I could neatly pack with skyscrapers. Or this design that was focused on creating large plazas and parks while having as few roads as possible. You don't want to turn buildings sideways in the middle of your city, as it will leave large gaps and take up more space than it should. Making a city with a good design doesn't just look good, it'll also have a much higher building density which will help your tropicans out by cutting down on travel times and it'll also help you spread building bonuses to more buildings. As we can see here, this fast food joint is affecting a very large amount of residential buildings. If you're trying to create a city that has different sections for different classes but can't figure out why rich tropicans won't live in the mansions, it's because most of the time, tropicans won't search around for the best housing but instead they will choose the house that is closest to their job sites. But moving on to infrastructure buildings, the first one is the dock. Never build a second dock unless you're regularly exporting more than 10,000 units of a trade good. Get a higher efficiency on your dock and the advanced boat services edict if you want to import goods faster. For the construction office, if you plan on having a poor island, then I'd recommend slowly building them as you expand. But if you're going to go for a rich island, I'd say don't bother building more than like three as you'll probably be able to just quick build everything. I wouldn't recommend doing the ignore safety regulation work mode unless the building has a low budget. Next up is the Teamsters office. A good way to know when you should build another Teamsters office is to regularly check on your production and industry buildings. Anytime you notice a couple of buildings have a storage containing close to a thousand units stored, this is usually when I decide to make another one. The second shift work mode costs more money than the price of just making a whole another Teamsters office, with the only real bonus being that it conserves space. I almost never go with the max budget, as this can get really expensive without you noticing. The only time I change the work mode to loose load limit is when I have the building on the lowest budget. And finally, you can set the office to do an emergency job. The most useful thing to do with this is to get one Teamsters office that is not upgraded, so you don't have too many people sitting around waiting, and to set it to take imported goods and bring it to a warehouse to ensure your imported resources get processed by your factories. Next is the landing in the Teamsters dock. They're pretty much the same building. The only difference is that the Teamsters dock can allow for the transportation of goods and can even employ workers to haul goods around. I talked about the warehouses a bit already, but I'll completely explain them. Make sure to always leave them on the allow storage option as the other two options will slowly lose goods as they'll be brought to the dock for some reason. Sometimes this option will stop industry buildings from processing goods. If you notice this happening, you need to switch it to the allow processing option, but this usually never happens. The upgrades will give the building up to two and a half times more storage space, but it will also increase the upkeep cost of the building. Electric substations are very simple. You need to construct them to link power grids. Coal power plants are pretty plain, but a quick tip is that one coal mine can fuel two coal power plants. Likewise, one uranium mine can fuel one nuclear power plant. 
Every power plant gives more electricity the higher the efficiency. The solar power plant gives the least amount at around 370 on the lowest budget and around 600 on the highest budget. It also costs more to upkeep than a coal power plant, which produces around 270 megawatts on the lowest budget and 450 megawatts on the max budget. Nuclear power plants cost the most to upkeep and produce the most electricity at around 600 on the lowest budget and 1000 on the max budget. Wind turbines are good options for electricity if your island will support it. Having a lot of conservatives on the island and and building a huge wind farm is a quick way to lose all of your support. Finally, we have the transportation buildings. Parking decks are hardly ever used correctly. First off, only rich tropicans and tourists can drive cars unless you activate the very expensive free wheels edict. Second is that people will only drive a car between two buildings that have road access. This means that if you want to have a lot of people driving around your island, then you need to make way more parking decks than you think you'd need and make sure to have as many rich tropicans or tourists on your island. Bus garages are good to use early on as the default work mode will let Tropicans with a job use the bus. Also a good tip is to set the starting bus stop to whichever bus stop is the furthest. This will save a little bit of time over the course of the bus station's life. Finally we have the metro station which is by far the best mode of public transportation and it also increases the housing quality of nearby residential buildings, but it will harshly decrease the crime safety nearby. And finally, we are on to the last topic of this guide, support. Having high support is important most of the time. It's fine to let it go down right after you win an election, but as an election approaches, you'll need to get it as high as you can. If you know how it works, you'll realize it's pretty easy to get a support over 80. The support score depends on two things. First of all is your overall happiness, which is simply an average of all the happiness scores below, so quickly I'll break all of them down. Food happiness is pretty easy to get to 100, and if your Tropicans food happiness gets too low, then they'll start starving to death. If we click on the food happiness tab, we can see which buildings are selling goods to the population. Here we can see that a bunch of buildings are. Tropicans will always try to go to the buildings that provide the highest food quality that they can afford. Broke Tropicans can only afford to get food from production buildings, but these buildings provide terrible food happiness score. Usually I try to have zero broke Tropicans and make sure to set all the production buildings to not allow local consumption. This will make it so that your Tropicans only go to groceries and shopping malls. To get a high service quality from these buildings, max out the budget and provide all the different foods that you can produce. Even cheese, canned goods, and juice, which are all produced in industry buildings. If you're using shopping malls, then you want to fill them with as many consumer and luxury goods as you can. If you're using groceries, set some of your canneries to the work mode supply local market. This should all bring you close to, if not more than 100 happiness score for your food happiness. For faith happiness, the main way to get a better happiness score is to build plenty of clerical buildings and to get better budgets on them. A cathedral on the max budget gives a service quality of 100. If your Tropicans have a low faith score, then they won't make new families. Tropicans will always search for the building that provides the highest service quality. Fun happiness is very easy, just make sure to always build enough entertainment buildings. You can check the overlays to see if you have too many entertainment buildings that are completely booked. A lot of entertainment buildings can provide a service quality over 100, but for poor Tropicans, your best bets are to be either taverns with every bonus that you can possibly get, and you can get a score of 80 even for broke Tropicans with the golf course, as long as it's in an area of high beauty. Always upgrade your radio stations if they affect the entertainment buildings, as this can boost the whole island's fun happiness score by 5. On to healthcare happiness. If you build a rich island, then you'll probably never really need to worry about this as long as you keep putting down healthcare buildings when you need them, and making sure that the service quality is as high as you can get. But if you're making a population of only poor people, then you can use the the clinic on the lowest budget and all of the upgrades to get a service quality that's above 50. And if you set the healthcare option in the constitution to paid healthcare, then you can make the clinic on the lowest budget give a service quality of 67. When going this route in the late game, I always activate the compulsory vaccination and alternative food source edicts whenever they're off cooldown to provide just a little bit more healthcare. On to housing happiness, a huge tip is that you never want to leave any Tropicans without a home. Even if you're housing them in the worst housing in the game, they'll still have a higher happiness score than leaving them in shacks. On top of that, if you use any budget besides the max budget, you'll actually be gaining money every month due to the rents. If you set residential buildings to the max budget, they'll usually just pay for themselves. So there isn't a good reason to not house your entire population. Fashion companies, fast food joints, fire stations, and metro stations can all provide a bonus to nearby housing quality. If you're trying to have an entire population of poor Tropicans, you can use tenement buildings to get a score of around 100 and still be able to house poor people. There isn't much to say about job happiness other than the fact that I've never gotten it to 100. You can use the mandatory siesta edict to get a decent bonus to the work happiness of the entire island, but it messes with the efficiency of all of your other buildings, so I never really use it. The most reliable way to get a high job happiness score is to have a lot of buildings on the max budget and to modernize all of your production buildings. Liberty happiness is very important to keep above 50, especially in locations where your Tropicans can regularly be found. If you notice 
notice that your population is generating a lot of rebels for seemingly no reason, it may be because they're wandering around near buildings that have a liberty penalty. The first major one early on is the commando garrison, so make sure to build these buildings away from your population. Many constitution topics will slightly affect global liberty, but the biggest one is the total surveillance and the privacy rights options at a negative 25% global liberty. I don't think that any edicts will affect liberty except for the right to arms edict, which when fully leveled up will give a plus 20% bonus to global liberty on the island. You can click on the liberty happiness tab here to see all the buildings that affect nearby liberty, as well as what is affecting your global liberty. You can also do this with crime safety. Liberty and crime safety are like two sides of the same coin. Usually you'll have one or the other, either a bunch of criminals or a bunch of rebels. Crime safety is a bit different as the only tropicans that can become criminals are unemployed tropicans in a low crime safety area. Criminals steal from other tropicans and this in turn loses you a small amount of money from your treasury. Criminals go from being broke to well off and if left alone for too long, then they'll grow into a crime lord and become filthy rich. If you strike a shady deal with a crime lord, you'll generate $100 per month to your Swiss bank account, and they'll become immune to persecution. This will also increase the chance that others will become criminals on the island as well. To have a high overall happiness, it's a good idea to lower crime safety and increase liberty, but what I find interesting is that these last two are kind of the most unique. You can actually create zones that foster crime and rebellion. But now on to the very last topic for the guide, and that is the factions. You need to have a high overall happiness score as well as a high standing with your factions to reach a high support. If we check out the politics tab in the almanac, we can see that the factions are split into two sides. These factions are opposites, and you can see that your population is roughly split between them, with people that have indifferent views in the middle. Each faction deserves its own guide, which I plan on making in the near future, so be sure to subscribe if you're interested in learning about the different factions in depth. But in this guide, I want to cover the basics. One way to get a high support is to try and make all the factions happy. You probably won't make it too far though as each faction has things that will make the other side unhappy. What I think is a much better method is to influence your population into one side or the other for each pair of factions and support that side fully. Just as an example, I had an idea for a hippie island that was centered around the environmentalist faction and also supported the communist, religious, and intellectual factions. These factions and choosing which sides to support and influence everyone towards are the single most powerful tools you can use to create unique islands. Just to name off a few, you can make a capitalist or a communist utopia focused on the aforementioned faction, or maybe a military dictatorship where voting isn't a thing and you support the militarist faction all the way. Or maybe an industrial island where you exploit every nook and cranny of the island and support the industrialist faction. You can choose builds that are focused on one or more faction to create all different types of island layouts. This is by far my favorite mechanic of the game and what leads to the best looking islands. I have yet to try to make a dystopia like the one from George Orwell's 1948, but I've gotten very close ones when I was setting up a communist island. But now that I've given a brief overview as to why it's agreeable to learn how to influence your population, I want to give the very basic method that I use when setting up islands. First off is you want to build all of your housing within areas that are affected by a newspaper. It's fine to miss a few here and there, but Getting them all within these zones is ideal. For the first era, you want to set up two newspapers, one set to the independent work mode and the other one set to the penny saver work mode. The reason for this is that once you make it to the World Wars era, you want to research the newspaper right away and set one either to capitalism or communism and the other to either religious or militant. This will make it so that right from the beginning of the era you'll be influencing your population. Then you want to make sure to build these same two newspapers every time you make a new residential zone that isn't affected by the previous newspapers. When the Cold War era rolls around, you want to set up at least one radio station and research it to allow you to influence your island to either the industrialist or environmentalist factions. You want your radio stations to be affecting as many workplaces as you can, and thankfully the radio station has a very large area of effect. Finally, when you make it to the modern times era, your population gains access to the last two factions in the game, the intellectuals and the conservatives. This is where I use the final media building, the TV station, to influence the population into one of these two factions. Again, you need to research the TV station to do this. You also need to electrify every residential building for the TV station to be able to influence people. Never use the state-controlled media option in the constitution, as this will break all of your media buildings and they'll actually never influence people. You'll want to slowly grow your island and keep Keep up with the zones with media buildings. Your first two newspapers will only go so far and eventually you'll need to build more. Some final ways to influence your population are the Cult Anonymous Edict which will influence your population towards the conservative faction. High schools can be researched and can be set to different work modes to influence graduates. And if you research the movie theater you can use this as an additional media building. Influence your population into whatever beliefs you want and support those sides fully and have a high overall happiness score 
and you'll never run into support problems again. But that is my complete beginner's guide to Tropico 6. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you learned something new, leave a like. If you have additional tips of your own that I didn't go over, leave a comment. And if you want to see more strategy game content like this, be sure to subscribe. Peace.